Our p orbitals are slightly more complicated than our s orbitals, but not by a lot. Uh, let's go ahead and switch over to the Orbitron, and we'll take a look at things more three-dimensionally, and then we'll come back over here to fill out anything else in your handout. So here you see the three p orbitals, and notice that there are three different ones that are there. There's one that's sitting along the z-axis, there's another sitting along the x-axis, and you can see that there's a third sitting along the y-axis. Now, each of these are going to be one of the 3p subshell. And we're going to specify it by adding a subscript to it. So the 2pz is the one that sits right along the z dimension. 2px sits along x. And 2py, right over here, is going to sit along the y dimension. Now, it specifies here, if you look just a little bit lower, that the wave function has two different signs. It mentions that the blue zone is for the negative value and green zone is the positive value. Now let me remind us of what we're actually talking about and point at the wave function for just a moment. Now this is what the wave function is going to look like. You can see there is a section in the equation where there is a negative value and a section in the equation where there is a positive value. Keep that distinct in your mind from charge. The electron is always going to be a negative charge. It's just that when you look at the mathematics of it, the equations that I've shown you before in some of the videos, there's going to be a segment of the equation that has a negative sign and a segment that has a positive sign. None of that has any importance when we're talking about the physical reality of it, though. What it does tell us is that there's one region of space where an electron's likely to be, and the other region of space is where the other electron's likely to be. But the electron can be in either of the two places at any given time. People like to think of the red zone as having one electron, the blue zone as having the other. But that's just a little too simplistic. Remember, we're in the quantum mechanical world, and things are much more complicated. Now, let's take a look at the radial distribution so we see exactly what things look like along with radius. Now, you see as we start here at the nucleus, we'll have a big area with a lot of probability of finding our electron. There's going to be a node here in the center where there's going to be zero probability of finding the electron. We're going to have a lobe over on this side. We're going to have a second lobe over on the other side of our nucleus. Keep in mind that it goes both directions from there. So this is what a 2p orbital looks like. Now this is the 2p orbital. It has a node right there at the center, but as we go to higher levels, what we're going to see is we're going to pinch things off one time. Let's take a look at the 3p orbital. So this is going to be what the 3p orbital looks like. You can see that artistically they've gone for a pink and yellow, which is a little bit hard to see on the monitor. But this and this are going to be the same color. This and this are the same color. It'll be a little easier for us to see if we switch over to a dots view. Now if we look down here, you can see that, and I can rotate this around a little bit, you can see that it's going to have the blue and the red zones. Red, red, blue, blue. We've got a pinch right here and a pinch right there. And I like to describe these as being like balloon animals. When you pinch it, that's one of our nodes. On each side of the node will be one of the lobes. So you see here that we have a total of four lobes, and we'll have one, two nodes. Yeah, there's a sec another one over here, but we usually don't consider that as one because we're counting outward from the nucleus. So I'd call this having two nodes, one at the x-axis origin, and then one right here. Now, we can also take a look at something more complicated like the 5p. And you can see that all we're going to do is add an extra pinch each of those times. Now let's come back over to our handout and finish filling that out. So what we see here is a p orbital, and it's the 2px orbital. You can see here our radius is in angstroms, uh, radius times 10 to the negative 10, that'll be angstroms. You can see that we're out there at about 4 angstroms, and yeah, even extending out to 6. But the core of it's going to be inside of 4 angstroms. So we are talking about a larger sort of atom now. And keep in mind that it's going both directions. So this thing's probably going to be seen as being 8 to 10 angstroms wide. Now, the subscript is telling us information about the direction it's sitting. That's going to be even more important if we're talking about the d orbitals, and you'll see that in a separate video. This is just telling us the direction that it lies, though. And these directions are completely arbitrary. It doesn't specify a real direction, because remember, this thing is rotating in space. We're just locking it in and looking at it from our own perspective. Now, x does not necessarily correspond with one of those quantum numbers. So remember, for one of these p orbitals, the orientation quantum number can be either negative 1, 0, 
or positive 1. However, we don't have to say that this is x, and that this one's y, and that this one's z. These can be correlated to any of them that you'd like. So really, you get to pick what quantum number you give it for the value. You also get to pick what letter you want to call the orientation in space, unless, of course, we've already defined the axes. Now, let's go ahead and fill this one out. Take a moment, pause the video, and give this one a try. OK, so in this case, we know our principal quantum number, n, is going to be 2. Now, keep in mind, p, we know that for our second quantum number, l, 0 is going to be s orbitals. 1 is going to be a p orbital, 2 will be a d orbital, 3 will be an f orbital, and then for higher numbers it goes on from there. So this is going to be a p orbital, also known as quantum number 1. For m sub l, we get to pick which one we want, because like we specified over here, unless we actually say which direction it's going, we get to pick. So in this case I'd say negative 1, or I'd say 0, or I'd say 1. However, if you're asked to give possible quantum numbers for a specific electron, you've got to pick one. You get to have any answer you choose correct. But if you give me all three, and you write like this, this would be an incorrect answer. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to pick one set of quantum numbers. For one quantum number set, we pick one of the values and lock it in. Now here you can see what it looks like in three dimensions. We have our z-axis. Keep in mind that all of them are going to exist at the same time. So we're also going to have the y and the x-axis. And you can see that it ends up looking like you're holding six balloons in your hand. This is one orbital. This one is another. And then this one is another. Both halves are part of the same orbital. 